Jesus, we speak your name this morning. The name above every name. The name at which every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Every sin is forgiven. Every demon is defeated. Every kingdom is subjugated. Every soul is saved. Every marriage is restored. Every family is rebuilt. Every church is founded upon. And everyone will know the powerful name that is Jesus. We speak that name this morning, oh God. It is because of that name that we gather. It is in that name that we worship. And Lord, it is that name that we glorify today. We glorify you, the mighty and sovereign Savior King, as the one in whom our salvation is secure. Jesus, we worship you today. We worship you not only for all that you have done, from creating us, to calling us, to saving us, to redeeming us, to giving us a citizenship in your kingdom to come, and all that you have yet to do. Lord, we praise the mighty name of Jesus. Receive our deepest worship, God, from the depths of our hearts, because we recognize you are the true king and we are your subjects who have come to glorify your name today. Jesus, we love you and we worship you. And it is in your name in which we offer this prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus and his church said, amen. Amen. Church, please be seated. While we stay in this atmosphere of worship, we're going to do what is probably the most Christian thing you could possibly do, which is to celebrate the Lord's table, communion. It's been called a bunch of different things. This is the very institution of worship that Jesus himself put in place all the way back the very week of his death and resurrection. And he gave us a very clear instruction. He said, each time you do this, Do this in remembrance of me. This is the quintessential Christian act of worship. And we're going to celebrate that. So my deacons, elders, those of you who know your roles, if you will please stand and take your places. Those of you who are joining us online or virtually, even if you're watching this after our service takes place, I want to ask you right now, go to your kitchen, go get a piece of bread, go get a a juice element so that you can worship along with us. Because the great thing about communion, here's the cool thing. Communion or the Lord's table is done in every language that's ever been Christian, right? It doesn't need a translation because the body and the bread are found in Jesus and he doesn't need a translation. So it doesn't matter if you worship in Spanish or English or German or Hawaiian because the elements are always the same. So this is what's gonna happen. For those of you who are worshiping here in house with us this morning, my deacons are right here. The back half of the room, they're gonna dismiss you by rows. There are communion elements just outside the main doors of the sanctuary. You're gonna go that way, get your elements and come back. The front rows here, you're going to come to this table and get your elements and go back to your seat. Those of you who are watching at home, go ahead, you get your elements, come back to your seat. But I wanna ask that nobody take them yet. Don't actually receive the elements so that we can do this act of worship collectively in remembering Jesus. So deacons, if you'll go ahead and begin to dismiss our people.
the New Testament tells us that it was the very same night that Jesus was about to be betrayed, handed over to the Jewish Sanhedrin, ultimately to be crucified, that he created this act of Christian worship. Now, if you uh, last month we looked at it, we're really standing on top of the Jewish Passover meal, which prefigured the Passover lamb being sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus stands on that foundation, and then he reminds us today as Christians, when he took the bread element, he turned to his disciples and said, this is my body. Not just a random perfect lamb. This is the perfect lamb. Jesus said, this is my body. Church, let's take the bread this morning. And likewise, as they completed and concluded the Passover meal, he took one of the four cups. He said, my disciples, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Church, let's take the juice element this morning. Jesus, I am so thankful for your forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, thank you that you loved me enough to pay the penalty long before I was ever born so that I could be a member of your kingdom and a citizen of your name. Jesus, we worship you this morning. It's in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Oh, that's right. I guess you really don't have to run the video since I'm already here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, good morning. My name is Bill. I'm the pastor here at Catalyst. I get the privilege of sharing with you from the Word of God. Just go ahead and set up my stuff. We are going to be continuing our teaching series entitled, In the Beginning. And if this is your first time joining us for worship, whether you are online or here on campus, it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of a sermon. This is not just a sermon where I stand up here and talk and you just sit there and listen. This is an interactive sermon. I've designed this sermon series for you to ask questions as we walk through the text of the Bible. So you'll notice on the handout that the ushers gave you this morning, there's a line highlighted in yellow that says, here's where you ask your questions. For those of you who are here on campus, there's a little QR code right next to that section. If you scan that QR code with your smartphone, it will auto-launch a window and you can submit your question. Uh, my wife and Miss Donna are in the back. They'll receive your questions and put them right here on my iPad so that as we walk through the text, we can examine all that we want to examine. So as they get ready for that, the title of this morning's message is The Fall. And our text will be Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 3, just the first six verses. There is a lot of information, as we're discovering, in these opening chapters of Genesis. And I, won't, I will absolutely admit to you, when I prepared for this teaching series, I really only thought it was going to be three weeks. Dan, I thought we'd take a week in, in chapter 1, we'd take a week in chapter 2, we'd take a week in chapter 3, we'd wrap it up, go home, and be at Taco Bell for lunch. I quickly realized, with the number of questions that were coming in, I needed to slim down the scope, slow down the boat, and let us have the time to go through. So we're going to go through chapter 3 a little bit slower so that we have the time to ask the questions. So here's the key thought that wraps all of these messages together. The opening chapters of the Bible set the theological stage for us to understand God's relationship to humanity. The opening chapters of the Bible set the theological stage. Now, on the back of your handout, right above the blank notes portion, I gave you kind of a little outline of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, how they go together so that you'll understand where we're at. Chapter 1 is the origin of everything. Chapter 1 teaches us that God made stuff. God made all the stuffs. And then you get to chapter 2, and a lot of people want to know, well, why does chapter 2 recapitulate or retell the story? Isn't that a contradiction? No, it's not. Because the focus of chapter 2 isn't that God made stuff. It's how and why God made stuff. 
So chapter 1 teaches us that God created. Chapter 2 shows us how and why God created. Then in chapter 3, which is where we'll be this morning, we find the origin of sin and the consequences, and now we find out what happened to creation. So that God created in chapter 1, how and why he created chapter 2, what happened to all that he created chapter 3. So the first thing I'd like to do is read the first six verses of chapter 3. Then we'll go back, we'll go through it verse by verse, and we'll get ready to, uh, to answer some fun questions. There definitely, there's definitely some funny ones in here. Probably not going to have Adam and Eve belly button this week. But um, there are some interesting questions. So let's take a look at this. Genesis chapter 3. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And that's where we're going to stop because I think there's enough in these six verses to keep us busy for at least 20 minutes right so we'll stay busy enough we'll get up a little bit of hunger and then we'll go downstairs for a baby shower and play some games and we'll feel better about it all right so let's go back verse one chapter three verse one we open with now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the lord god had made notice in your english translation the lord in verse one is capital letters capital l-o-r-d Remember that that means the, the, co- the covenant name for God, Jehovah God, Jehovah Elohim. That means, again, from a Jewish theological perspective, they've already learned that God made stuff. Now they're learning what happened to the creation that God made for his covenant people. The serpent is more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. So let me go ahead and try to answer the question that's probably on its way in. Is the serpent real? That's a common question. And again, remember I told you when we started this series, there are multiple views of the opening chapters of Genesis. I fall into the literal grammatical camp. I think that any piece of literature should be examined in the form of literature that it is. We don't go to the Gospels, which is largely historical narrative, and study those the same way we study, say, the book of Psalms, which is ancient Near Eastern Hebrew poetry. Poetry has different rules than narrative, right? So when I look at the grammatical style of Genesis 1 through 11, I see very little difference in the grammatical style of Genesis 2 through 49. So based on the literature, I would say our first task is, do we read this literally? I would say yes. The serpent represents an actual, real, biological, tangible serpent, right? But then I got to deal with the next accusation that's going to be brought at me. Well, doesn't this just sound like the other ancient Near Eastern mythologies of talking animals and gods who created things? Okay, fair point. Is there anywhere else in Scripture that I can go to frame my understanding of the serpent? Yes. Number one, you just mentioned it, Balaam's talking donkey. Now, he wasn't talking by virtue of a demonic power. God himself used a donkey to speak. But there's another one that I think is more interesting, and that is Jesus when he saves the Gadarean demoniac from the legion of demons. Jesus travels across the Sea of Galilee to the eastern shore, which is the land of Perea, in the the region of the Gadarenes, or your Bible may say Gerasenes. There's a little difference in translation. And he comes upon a man who is totally full of demons. He is demon to the hilt. And the demons come to the Savior, and they say, are you the Son of God here to cast us out? Please send us into the... Anybody know the last word? The swine or the pigs? 
the demons themselves ask the Son of God to let them enter the pigs rather than to be cast into this place called the abyss. So what I can see from the New Testament is the fallen angels had the ability to inhabit living creatures. So why should I, if I can see that in the New Testament, question it in the Old Testament? So I will present to you this morning the literal grammatical look at this text, and I'll say, yes, I believe the serpent is an actual real serpent. Do I believe the serpent is talking in and of its own serpentness? No, I do not. I've, and that is why when you get to the book of Revelation and John the Revelator refers to Satan, he refers to him as the serpent of old, right? So we're talking about a literal animal that is inhabited by a fallen angelic presence. Now the fallen angelic presence is who's doing the talking. It's doing the talking through the animal. Do I think that's weird? Yes. <laughs> I do think that's weird. But do I think that's any weirder than God being born as a baby or choosing to die innocent for us who is guilty? Or, oh, I don't know, a man who died and came back to life. No. I think it's in line with the whole story of the Bible. And here's the other thing. For those who choose to take the mythical view that Genesis 1 through 11 is mythology, it never actually happened, and then at Genesis 12, we switch over to a, a narrative history because we know that Abraham lived. You've just created a major theological problem for yourself, and I'll explain why. If Genesis chapter 3 isn't real, it's just a mythology, if it's not literal, then that means sin isn't real. It's not literal. And if sin isn't real, there's no need for a savior. So if you believe in Jesus and you believe that Jesus died to forgive us for sin, then that means you believe in sin, which means we have to explain where sin came from. And that's why I don't think Genesis 1 through 11 should be written off as mythology because you give up the gospel if we give up Genesis 1 through 4. So the serpent in verse 1, and here's the first question. Why did God make Satan so crafty in the beginning to test Adam and Eve? I don't think the text here says the serpent or that Satan was crafty. It says the serpent was crafty and it's inhabited by Satan. Now, why did God make Satan crafty? Well, God didn't make Satan. God made an angel who then fell and became Satan. Right? So God is, and this is another huge point for the Christian worldview right? The Christian worldview can do one thing that, that pretty much every other worldview can't do. The Christian worldview can explain the origin of evil. We can tell you where it came from. We can explain the problem of evil. Why is there evil in the world today when we all know in our hearts there shouldn't be? And the Christian worldview can offer the solution for evil. Atheism can't do that. Pantheism can't do that. Polytheism can't do that. Panentheism can't do that. We can do that. And that's why I think this text should be taken pretty seriously. So, second question. Had Lucifer fallen from heaven before the fall to influence the spirit? Yes, absolutely. So the Bible doesn't, the Bible tells us that the angels fell, but it doesn't tell us when the angels fell. So the when has to be a calculation, just like the other things we've looked at as calculations. When was the angelic fall? The book of Psalms tells us that the entire angelic host was there to marvel and glory at God's creation. And here in Genesis chapter 3, the fallen angels are already on earth because Satan is now tempting humanity. So if I put those two facts together, here's the best thing I can tell you. The angelic fall happens somewhere after Genesis 1-1 and somewhere before Genesis 3-1. But I think to try to get any more specific than that, you're, you're going to start standing on not so solid ground. I'm sure beyond a shadow of a doubt the angelic fall had to happen before this verse or else there is no satan in the garden there is no sin there is no temptation if there's not a tempter so to answer the question directly yes the angels have to have fallen before genesis chapter 3 but since god didn't really make everything until genesis 1 1 now the alternate view would be that he, the angel, angels fell before god created anything in the physical space time i find that one hard even though angels are spirit beings, which is true, they could exist in a completely metaphysical sense. It, Gary, it just makes more sense to me. After 1-1 one, one, and before 3-1. Uh, knowing how crafty Satan is, 
What are your thoughts on, and the question's still coming in, so give me just a second. Knowing how crafty Satan is, what are your, are your thoughts on discernment from hearing God's voice or hearing the lies of Satan? Whoever asked that question, you get the gold star of the day. That's dope. So, knowing how crafty Satan is, what are your thoughts on discernment of hearing God's voice versus hearing the lies of Satan? Here's what I will say. I think God made man to be in his image. Sin caused that image to be scarred, right? But salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives us access to a power of discernment that exceeds our own fallen nature. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't have no fallen nature. The Holy Spirit is the eternal God. So I will say, in a human being by himself or herself, do I possess the natural ability to fully discern the work of the enemy? No, I don't think so. Because I was born into a fallen world and this fleshly, albeit really good-looking body is still sinful, right? (laughs) But the Holy Spirit that lives within me is not. And I will say, if you are a Christian, you are indwelt with the Spirit, that provides the ability to have discernment against lies the enemy. Next question. How was Satan able to fall so far that he became such an evil power? Was there no way to stop it? Another really great question. I don't think the fall of Satan changed his power at all. He was created. In fact, there are only two archangels mentioned in all of the Protestant scriptures. One is named Lucifer. Anybody know what the other one is? Mike. Whoo, that was fast. Man, y'all are good. Right. Mike Angel, the Archangel Michael and the Archangel Lucifer are the only two archangels mentioned in all of Scripture. I don't think Satan's actual compositional makeup, his ability, his powers changed at all when he fell. You know what changed? The purpose behind the power. And that's one of the reasons when you study angelology and demonologies kind of underneath of angelology, you realize that if, if fallen angels and faithful angels are all angels then that means anything one group does, logically, the other group has the ability to do. Now, we do know there are different kinds of angels. Unfortunately for us, archangels all the way at the top. So when he fell, he fell and he kept all the same powers. But now, he's decided to use all of them against the Lord God and against the Lord God's people. Um, Next question, was Eve eating the fruit, uh, was Eve eating the fruit, the first sign of sin and disobedience to God? Good question. Mel, keep that one at the top so when we get closer to verse 6, I can answer that question then. So verse 1, the serpent, it's totally a real animal. It's inhabited by a fallen angelic presence, and that's the presence that's doing the talking. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You know what's really interesting about this sentence at the end of verse 1? God did actually say the words... Um, Here we go, verse 1. You must not eat and from any tree in the garden. If you go back to chapter 2, God actually said both halves of those sentences. But Satan reordered them in such a way that it sounds like something God didn't say. You know what he actually did say? He said, you may eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of that one tree. So do you see how Satan took two exact quotes from God's word and slightly changes their orientation and now it's communicating something God didn't say. God did, in fact, even in the Hebrew, those are the literal words of God twisted to say something God did not say. Do I, where else in scripture do I see this? When I look at the temptation of our Lord in the New Testament, What does Satan use to tempt Jesus? The very word of God. He knows, and let's just be honest, we are mere humans, we're mortals. Satan, the deceiver, knows the entire word of God better than you and I ever will in this life. He does. And he is is incredibly powerful at twisting it just enough that it makes it sound like you're doing something that's right when in actuality you're doing something that's wrong. And if we look over the history of the Christian church, I'm not going to back down from it. Our history is pretty dark and pretty bloody and pretty scary at some places. Let's let's not apologize for the mistakes of our past. Let's apologize for the mistakes of today and fix them. I can't go back and change the Spanish Inquisition, but do I think it was godly? Absolutely not. 
So in verse 1, Satan quotes two different quotes from God. God said, you may eat of any tree in the garden, but do not eat. Satan rewords them into something else. Question, if Eve was the one to sin first, why does Adam get blamed for sin or the world? I will absolutely answer that question when I get to verse 6. Because that's a mondo important question. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, here I got to give props to Eve. Eve hears the incorrect phrasing of God's word and says in verse 2, we may eat from the trees in the garden. Now, here's an interesting question. Who told Eve about God's instructions of what they could and could not eat in the garden? Adam did. Because when God gave the instructions, Adam was still alone. So Adam correctly communicates God's word to who we now know is his wife. We looked at that at the end of the last chapter. Father of the bride hands over the wife to the son. They become one family. That's what the whole end of chapter 2 is all about. Adam does correctly communicate God's instructions to his wife. She says, no, no, no. I can eat from the trees in the garden. I will not accept your twisting of God's word. Why? Because I know it was communicated to me in the right fashion. Right? Husbands, that's you. When your family has questions about the Bible, it's your job to answer them. If you do not feel adequately prepared, it's my job to fix you. It's your job to lead them. We talk about that all the time in men's fraternity. It's my job to sharpen you. I am the big, fat, ugly, scratchy stone on which everybody else gets sharpened. That's okay. I accept. Gladly, willingly, I accept. I will rough you up every time. Because, because, right here. And let me just ask you a simple question. The men, those of you who are with your wives, those of you who have children, if you had the ability to stop your family from committing a disobedience against God that would bring them punishment, would you choose to let it slide? No, you wouldn't. You would stand in the gap and you would get it done. So how does Eve know the right command? Because Adam told it to her. Look at verse 3. But did God say, you must not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden? So Eve, again, is correctly quoting. Got another question here. Why do angels fall? Do they have free will? This is a wonderfully debatable question. But I think the obvious answer is they have to have free will or there is no fall. Right? There is no way to choose something other than what God desires if there is no way to choose. So yes, I would argue angels do have free will. The follow-up question that somebody's probably typing, do angels still fall today? The scriptures do not speak to it directly. All I can tell you is, I believe that angels are free will creatures in the same way that we're free will creatures, but made totally different than us. Angels are spiritual beings that can be physical. We are physical beings that are made to be spiritual. But as a whole, angels and humanity were created as free will creatures. Verse three, but God did say, now Eve correctly quotes God's word, the only law at this point. Like, can you imagine like the entire Old Testament law? Nancy, we got one rule. Don't eat that one tree. And humanity still fails. Verse three, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. How many trees are in the middle of the garden? Right. But how many trees in the middle of the garden are they not allowed to eat? One. I think that's very important. The fact that Eve uses the singular means she understands the other tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, the tree my creator gave me so that I can be fully refreshed and restored in his presence. Yeah, I'm totally allowed to groove on that anytime I want. It's like snack time, day in, day out. But there is a tree right next to it, right? In verse 3, she only mentions the tree that is prohibited. She doesn't mention the tree that is allowed. Why? Because it's just like every other tree. It's just like every other tree in the garden. I can eat from it all I, all I want. Now, Eve adds something here. She says, you must not touch it or you will die. Chapter 2, God never says you must not touch it to Adam. However, Eve says it here to the enemy. So what does this mean? I'm going to give you two choices. Some scholars like to look at it and say, this is the first glimpse of humanity trying to make the hedge around the law, right? We try to make our own rules so that we don't violate God's rules. I think that's flawed. And why? Because at this moment right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, Eve isn't fallen. She's still 
totally righteous, clean, and pure before God. So to read back a fallen nature before the fall seems theologically suspect. So why does she say, I don't even want to touch it? I don't believe it's motivated by a, um, a legalism or a self-righteousness. I think it's motivated by, I love my daddy enough that I'd like to see, I want him to see me just not even get near enough to it, right? Because at this point, this is the beginning of temptation. She hasn't given in yet. There is no fallen nature for humanity. Um, verse four. So first, Satan twists God's word. Here in verse four, he directly contradicts. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. So Satan's first tactic was to twist God's word. That's why it's so important, so important that you never trust anything I say. Because I can make mistakes. I'm a human being. I'm a flawed human being. Trust me. Sit down, buy my, buy my wife a coffee. She'll tell you all about it. I am a flawed human being. I do my best to study and be as prepared as possible. But I expect everyone I teach the Bible to, to go back, look at the text for themselves, and make sure that what I say makes sense. Because I don't want you to trust in my words. I want you to trust in his words. Right? That's what's important. So look, your pastor just said, never trust me again. <laughs> Satan here in verse 4 now directly contradicts God's word. No, you will certainly not die. Now, we've got an objective problem here. God says, do this and you will die. Satan says, do this and you will not die. They cannot both be true at the same time. This is the logical law of non-contradiction, right? Die and not die cannot both be true at the same time in the same sense. Only one is true and the other, by virtue of logic, is obviously false. But Satan is presenting it as he is the true one and God is the false one. So this is not just an attack on God's word. This is a direct attack on God's character and his nature. Watch this. Verse 5. Verse 4 says you will certainly not die. Verse 5. For God knows when you eat, your eyes will be open. Just take a minute. What is, the, what is the enemy saying to Eve right here? He's saying, okay, you're not really going to die. God told you you will die because he knows what you'll get if you eat that. Now here's the question. Is Satan lying? Well, let, let's think it through. What does Satan say here? God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. Is that a true statement? It totally is. Is it true that God prohibited the eating of the tree because of the eyes being opened? Yes. It is true that God knows if humanity sins, their eyes will be opened and they will know evil. Satan is tempting with the very truth of God. You know what he's changing? Look at this. Look at the end of verse 5. You will be like God. He is using a true statement, but he's changing the motivation. He's saying, no, 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 no. You'll totally be like God. And he doesn't want you to be like him. See, he's, he's throwing shade at God's character, not at God's truth. Satan knows the reality is humanity will sin. They will become knowledge of good and evil. So Satan's temptation is actually true. But where the twist is, is not with the words, but with the motivation. I want to get you to doubt God's loving character. Because if you can doubt his character, here's... here's, here's Here's the quote for the day, ready? If you doubt God's character, you'll never have a problem breaking God's word. And that's the original temptation to humanity. I'm gonna twist God's word, Ryan, that didn't work. She quoted the text back to me exactly as it is. Fine, you wanna say you know the book? Great, I'm gonna make you question the author. Because if you question the author, it doesn't matter what he says, right? If, as, as the atheists portray, that God, the entire universe is a cosmic accident from quantum physics and evolution, and there is no God. If there is no God, then what that no God says doesn't matter because the words are mythology. They're meaningless. But on the other hand, if there is actually a God, then I would say what he says really matters a whole heck of a lot. Right? That's the other quote. Whole heck of a lot. 
Verse 5, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. Again, here's where the Christian worldview outshines everybody else. We have a reason for why there's evil in the world. From the atheist perspective, evil is nothing but personal preference. The atheist has no intellectual grounds to say that Hitler was any worse than Mother Teresa. All Hitler did was something I didn't like, and Mother Teresa did something I did like. But if there is such a thing as evil, well, then I'm on the hook to explain where it comes from. And the Christian worldview does that better than anybody else. But only if chapter 3 was real, right? If we give up chapter 3 and we say, oh, it's just a mythology, it's just a, a story about talking animals, blah, 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 blah then we've given up our grounding for sin. We've given up our grounding for how do I know what evil is? And if you give up sin and evil, you've given up the gospel because there's no point in solving a problem that's just mythological. Got another question. The tree of life is also mentioned in Revelation. Does this mean the tree of life exists today? Great question. The easy answer is, I don't know. Is it possible that the tree of life in Revelation is the same as the tree of life in Genesis? It is absolutely possible. What I say, is it even probable that God doesn't have to make two trees of life? Yes, it is. Because why would God place an angel to guard the entrance to Eden if the tree still didn't exist? But see, that's an inference. It's not a direct quote from the book. So I'll say, the easy answer is, I don't know. If you wanted my personal opinion, my pastoral opinion, yes. The tree in Revelation is the same in Genesis. Where is it on planet Earth today? No clue. I got nothing for you. The plate tectonics of the flood completely changed our planet. I have no idea where it is. God could pull it up from the bottom of the ocean for revelation, for all I know. But yes, if you want my opinion, I do think they're the same. Can I prove it from the Bible? No, I cannot. Um, okay. Knowing good and evil. Here's the other thing I need you to understand about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Somebody's going to ask the question, why would God make the tree in the first place? Right? Why does God bother making the tree if he knows that we eventually could choose it. Here's the easy answer. Without choice, there is no love. If God wanted a relationship where humanity freely chose to choose him, to choose love, to choose obedience, he had to create a scenario in which humanity also had the right to choose not him and to choose disobedience. Or else, all you've done is pre-program pre a robot that says, I love you, mommy, I love you, daddy. If you could just pre-program a robot, would that make you feel like you were truly loved? No, because that love isn't choice. Just adults, ask yourself, what do we call physical affection when it's not optional? Right? You don't have to say the word out loud, but for all the adults who get where I'm going, right? That's not love. Why? Because love requires choice. And for a free will creature to be able to love his creator or her creator, that very creator had to offer you the choice to not love. For instance, often people in arranged marriages are accused of their, their marriage has no love because it was prearranged. What I think is unfair about that, and I actually know a young lady who had an arranged marriage. She's two or three years younger than me. I knew her when I was in high school. She had already known at that point who she would marry at age 20. Their parents had worked it out when they were like seven years old. And a lot of people are looking at me right now going, oh, that poor girl. You know what that girl never had to do throughout all of middle school and high school? She never knew heartache. She never had any other boy look at her the wrong way because she knew she was already chosen, she was already selected, she was already loved. And she was already destined to be with somebody who loved her the same way. It's not a bad thing for God to have a plan for your life. But he does have to offer choice. Um, okay, then we get to verse 6. Now here's where the temptation takes root in Eve's heart. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Stop right there at that comma. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was, right here, good for food and pleasing to the eye. Does anybody notice that these are the two very same descriptions that God created in the beginning. These two are noticing that things are exactly the way God made them. And if we stopped here at good for food and pleasing for the eye, 
we wouldn't have a problem. Unfortunately, here it is, also desirable for gaining wisdom. This is where the enemy's temptation takes root. And it's not in misquoting scripture. It's in mischaracterizing or mischaracterizing God's character. By creating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God offered humanity a choice. You can get your wisdom from me or you can trust in yourself. If you get your wisdom from me, it will always be righteous, it will always be true, it will always be holy, and it will always be guaranteed. But if you want to know things for yourself and make your own decisions about what's right and wrong, the tree is there. I would offer, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, I think we have the same thing. God made creation to sustain us physically, to offer us beauty and art to know about his majesty, and here's where we should have just not eaten the fruit. Because the temptation is questioning God's character and trying to give you something that God is prohibiting you from. And the, and, and the acu- accusation from Satan is that God's prohibition is holding you back. The reality is God's prohibition is protecting you. So many times I hear people mischaracterize the God of the Bible. Oh, you Christians, you have so many rules. You can't do all the fun things. And I'm like, you mean all the things that end with hangovers? Like the things that end in, in drunk car crashes? The things that end in a whole lot of evil, dark, deathy kinds of ways? Yeah, thanks. Why do we put guardrails on highways? Because we want you to stay in the lanes. Nobody looks at the guardrail and says, you know what? That guardrail is too constrictive. I think I want to drive off the bridge. But why then do we question the guardrails of God's word? Oh, that guardrail is too constrictive. I just want to sleep with who I want. That guardrail is too constrictive. I want to drink however much I want when I want. That guardrail is too constrictive. I just like sin. Yes, but the guardrails are there for your protection, not for your control. God's trying to say, I created you. I know what's best for you. Stay inside these guardrails and you will be blessed. go outside the guardrails and you're going to find death. If you're willing, and here's the, here's the, I cannot imagine the long-suffering patience of God watching humanity generation after generation drive right off the bridge and blame God for the crash. If God loved me, he would have saved me. No, if you were smart enough to obey, you would never have driven off the cliff. That's Right here, suitable for gaining wisdom. Humanity wants to decide for itself what's good and evil and what's right and wrong. So she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Please do me a favor. Everybody, underline it, long press, highlight, print it out in big, bold letters. These are the most important four words in this entire chapter. Because... It has been so commonly mistaught that Eve sinned first and then after being turned into some sort of temptatious vixen then takes the, 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 the sin and gives it to her husband. Who was with her? Men, here's what I need you to understand. Adam stood by silently while all of this temptation went down and never spoke up. So to answer the question, if Eve was the one to sin first, why does Adam get blamed? Because Adam was there to protect his wife and he failed. Adam was placed as God's regent on earth. Adam was given Eve as the perfect, suitable helper to serve God. And Adam stood by and did nothing while sin crept into his marriage and twisted his relationship with him and his wife. That's why Adam... Now, we're not going to get into the penalties of sin this week. We're going to do that next week. And I'll show you exactly why Adam's penalties are worse than Eve's. But this is exactly why. So let's look at, oh yeah, I'm on verse 6, right? Do I have a 7? No, this is it. I'm at 6. Good job. Right here, who was with her? Adam. So who participated in listening to the temptation and giving in to the sin? Adam. Men, and, and I'll, ju- I'll just 
to, I, I think I said the same thing at men's fraternity. Man, if there is sin in your house, you are silently standing by and letting it happen. The consequences of that sin are your fault. And that includes what happens to your kids. It is your job to stand up. Because here's the cool thing. Adam pre-fall. Pre-fall Adam is God's regent on earth. He has been granted the authority of God to rule the earth and subdue it. He and he alone possess the power to say, that is not true. Shut up. Get out of my garden. And Satan would have had to obey by silently being complicit and allowing his wife to be tempted and ultimately sinning along with her. Adam gave up his role as God's representative and handed Satan authority of earth. Which is why when you get to the New Testament, Satan is called the prince of the air. Satan stole the authority over earth from Adam with these four words right here. All of humanity now experiences sin because Adam didn't man up and protect his wife from sin. I realize this is like a heavy ending, but guys, you've already heard this once. So those of you who came on Wednesdays, this should be the refresher course. This is why it's so important that godly men stand up and do their job. This is why it's so important that men lead their families, that men lead their wives, that men leave the church. This in no way means Eve is not important. We dealt that last week with the word Azair, the perfect and equal partner. I could never do all that I do without my wife, hands down. Many of you may not know, I'm an auditory learner. I, when I try to read, I fall asleep really fast because I have stigmatism and my brain just shuts down and <clears throat> I'm gone. For the last five and a half years, my wife has read my college textbooks to me for me to pass my classes. Because if I hear it, number one, most beautiful voice on the planet, right? Let's be honest. So, but number two, when I hear it, I learn it better than if I read it. So the only reason, or I say the large reason of why I pass my classes with the grades I have is because my partner stands in the gap and covers my weakness. If I were to try to read the books, I get lost really fast. When I hear somebody read it, man, my brain fires off. Donna sometimes asks, she comes in my office and I'm listening to an audiobook, and I can listen to audiobooks at two times speed. And they're just going, blah, 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 blah. and she's like, Paul came in my office one day, he's like, is that speaking in tongues? What is that? <laughs> because I'm an auditory learner. Give it to me in my ear and I'll get it. Give it to me on a page and I got to read it like three and four and five. I have to read it to myself. Anybody have to do that? Got to read it out loud just so you can hear yourself say stuff? Yeah. That's why God gave me a partner that's perfectly matched for my weaknesses. But you know why? That's why I have to stand up and guard my family and my house. And men, if you don't do this and you are silently sitting by watching sin in your house, then you're the one that's going to be guilty for the death that that sin brings. And don't get me wrong, ladies... Absolutely, it takes two to lead a godly home. I'm not saying that the role of a godly wife is subjugated to. It is a partner with. And that's where I also think that an overly masculine view of this passage that incorrectly understands Azair, incorrectly understands Eve's role with Adam, then starts to think that women were created to be subservient to men. That is not what Genesis 2 and 3 teaches. Women were created because God himself said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good. Husbands, you're not enough. It's your job to be enough, but guess what? You're not enough without your partner, without your wife. And that's why when I get the chance to do uh, marriage counseling with young people before they get married, I bring them here. I bring them here and I say, this is your job. This is your job is to stop sin from coming into your house. Because we've all seen it, right? We've all seen families rocked by sin. Because he who was with her didn't speak up at the right time. So men, today kind of ends with you on the heavy. Today ends with you got to step up and do your job. Because you're designed to protect your wife, protect your family. So this is what I'd like to ask you to do. Oh, let me give you the takeaway first. Let me give you the takeaway and then we'll get out. The original recipe for temptation and sin has not changed. We must learn to recognize it and resist it. Here it is. Number one. Question God's word. 
Number two, question God's character. Number three, question God's authority. And number four, silently allow or participate in disobedience. Stop doing that and our families will be more godly. Stop doing that and our communities will see the power of God move in revival. Keep doing that and you will bring more death and more destruction into your marriage, into your family, and into your home. That's why it can't be mythology because there's too much that hangs on our lives today for this to be just mythology. It has to be true. So this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to ask the worship team to come back up and I'd like to ask all of you to pull out your Connect card. There's a card right there in the seat back in front of you if you'd like to use the physical card. However, you can also scan the QR code here. There was a QR code on your handout if you'd like to scan that. This is the part of the service where you need to participate. I've done my best job to teach you. Now you got to pony up. What are you going to do? How are you going to grow? What is your next step in your relationship with God today? If you're joining us online, you can go to catalyst302.com slash connect. There's a button there that says I attended online. You can click that button and participate with a connect card. Here's my question for you today. How are you doing in obeying God's word? How are you doing in trusting in God's character? And what are you going to change? Because I'll be honest, I'm a failure. I fail daily at being as righteous as I believe God wants me to be. There's nothing wrong with admitting that I still need more Jesus. There's everything wrong with admitting I'm good enough already, because we're not. Every day we're faced with the same choice. I can live in obedience. I can humbly be thankful for the God who loves me. Or I can just eat of what I want because I know better. Please hear me. Anytime you ingest sin, you invite poison and death in your life. That's the truth of the scriptures. The wages of sin is always death. I had a youth pastor when I was younger who said, sin is like chocolate-covered arsenic. It looks great. It might even taste good for a moment. But the moment you ingest it, you're poisoning your life. You're poisoning your soul. And that poison will seep out in your relationships with God, your relationships in your family, your marriage, your friends, your work. We've all seen how fast sin spirals out of control. And the lie that you can handle it on your own is a lie from the pit of hell. You can't. Sin is designed to kill us. Jesus came to save us. So I'm going to ask the worship team to sing over us and give us one final song. While they do that, I want to ask us, ushers, if you guys would come forward. We're going to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord this morning. Not out of compulsion, not because you're giving me a tip for a good sermon. That's not the way this works. We give to God because he's worthy, because he is owed our allegiance and our worship. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would receive all of our gifts and all of our commitments today into your storehouse to be stored up for the work of your kingdom so that more may come to know you as Savior, Lord, and King. Bless all of those who trust you in their finances today. Bless us as we go out in your presence, as we live in your presence, and as we do your work through the presence of your Spirit. Bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.